Okay, well, good evening. If you uh, step in my office on the wall behind my desk, there is a, a pen, uh, pen and ink drawing of Rocky Mountain Bible Church. This was the church I uh, met the Lord in. And it's right there on Main Street in Frisco, Colorado, a little resort town in the heart of the Rockies. And uh, it was my fourth or fifth time in church, the first time I remember hearing the gospel. I bring up that because, you know, I was thinking about this. What was your motivation uh, to accept Christ as your personal Savior? I remember mine. I, I didn't want to go to hell. That was pretty much it. Um uh, And it wasn't that the church was really preaching about hell, but when I heard the gospel, I understood that I had a sin problem. I understood God was holy and God provided a way through Jesus Christ that my sin problem could be solved. And it occurred to me that a holy God probably wanted nothing to do with me. And that would, that would not bode well for my eternal uh, existence. And so believing in Christ, accepting this gift of salvation seemed like the thing to do. Let me tell you what I didn't know. I didn't know that the benefits of salvation are, go well beyond escaping hell. Didn't know. Didn't know anything about that. All I knew was just what I told you. It's not necessary for a person to know all of the benefits, the results of salvation in order to be saved. You kind of find those out as you get moving. All that's necessary for salvation is to receive that gift by faith. But there are many benefits. I saw a list one time that's, the list said something like 36 things happen simultaneously the moment somebody places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 36. Seems like a weird number. It might be more, it might be less. Their list had 36. We're going to cover all 36 tonight. I'm just kidding. We're going to do four. We're going to do four. I'm going to give you the big four. These are things that happen whether you knew it or not. These are the results. I would say the benefits of salvation. And it's it's like starting a business. You know, some of you have started businesses. You start a business. You don't know everything that's involved. You don't know all the responsibilities. I know when I started my ministry, I didn't know all the legal responsibilities I had. I'd read a few articles, but I didn't know all I was on the hook for. But I also didn't know all the tax benefits either. So there's there's things that we learn along the way. But in reality, just when you start that business and just when you accept Christ as salvation, certain things happen and are true that moment, whether you know it or not. So we're going to talk about uh, four of those. The first one is the cardinal one, from which all others come. And so we're going to start with that. The first benefit, the first result of salvation is that we are declared righteous. We're declared righteous. The Bible word for that is justified. A simple definition is to be declared righteous, not to be made righteous. It's a big difference. To be declared righteous. It's kind of like a legal pronouncement in heaven that you, your insert your name, is now righteous. It's a declaration. It's not a statement of reality. How do we know that? Well, look around. There's not a righteous soul in this room. But we, in Christ, have been declared righteous. This is one of the great benefits uh, and this is the one that distinguishes Christianity from all other religions. Grace and faith. That this is something we receive by faith and that we do not then earn our declaration of righteousness. You can't. It's given to you. You are declared righteous. You are justified as a response to your simple faith, your trust and by God's grace. Uh, we can think of where this all began and get a picture of this by going back to really the first instance we see this in a very vivid way, and that's back in Genesis 15:6. Abram believed the Lord, 
and he, that's the Lord, credited it to him, that's Abram, as righteousness. So God told Abram what he was going to do for them. Abram believed the Lord, and God declared him. He gave him credit for righteousness. Does that mean Abram was now suddenly righteous? Well, you keep reading the story, you find out not really. But he was declared righteous as a response, as a reward for his faith. This is a benefit that comes of believing God. The psalmist David wrote this, and I want to give you the context. He sinned. He stole another man's wife, and he had that man murdered. You know the story. And he lived with that for a long time. Finally, he was confronted by the prophet about his sin, and he repented. And you know what? God forgave him. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? This is what David writes in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And then watch verse 2. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. So there's a, there's a credit here. So the sin of David is being imputed to God and the righteousness of God is being imputed to David. But our key passage is from the Apostle Paul. We're going to spend just a few minutes here tonight in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. I've given it to you on your handout. Follow along with me. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now stop. Follow the argument there. This righteousness is given. This is the declaration we're talking about. And it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your, your ethnicity, because we're all equally bad. It's not like we've all risen to the level of the good Jews. No, the Jews are bad and we're bad. We're all equally bad, and we fall short of God's glory. But this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. So you didn't know that, probably. I didn't. Sitting in the balcony of that church by myself, realizing I've got to do something about this message that I've heard, and I say, God, I believe that. I want that for me. And then in some legal declaration in heaven like a judge banging a gavel, Steve is declared righteous. I wish I could have known that. But I didn't know that. But it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me at the time I was unaware. Paul continues, verse 24. And all are justified, declared righteous, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Now that's, that, that's what it is that you're believing in that moment. That Christ is the sacrifice for your sin, the atonement for your sin through the shedding of his blood. His death is the sacrifice for you to be received by faith. People want to add stuff to the gospel. It, it is right there. You don't even need a whole verse to share the gospel. That's it. You receive it by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. Let's finish that verse, verse 26. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now what does it mean that God was demonstrating his righteousness? Well, his righteousness thinks your sin is abhorrent and deserves an eternity in hell. Deserves to be punished. Has to be gotten rid of. Has to be far from him. So in God's righteousness, he looks at your sin as damnable. So to satisfy his righteousness, he provides a substitute so that he can give you his own righteousness, but his own righteous standard is satisfied 
by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. All this happens the moment by faith you receive. God is solving every problem we've real the, the only real problem that we had. That we're cursed, we're sinners, we're stained, we're broken, we're we're deserving of death, and He solves that. So what happens then is there's an imputation of righteousness. Now, for that to happen, before God, now this is all happening simultaneously, but we kind of think about it in a logical way. Before God can declare you righteousness, what has to happen? Uh, well, he's got to take away something, right? <laughs> You've got a sin problem. You can't, you can't be have this legal reality of your sin and now be declared righteous on top of that. So there's this simultaneous, but we're going to think about it in a logical order. There's a subtraction of all that is sinful. And that's going to be legally then placed on Jesus Christ. And then there's the addition to you of the righteousness which belongs to Jesus is now being credited to you. So that, now why, why is that important? Okay, so your sin is imputed over to Christ. Okay, so it's no longer on you. And his righteousness is imputed over to you. So now it's all over you. Why is that necessary? So that when God says, and this is justified, when God declares you righteous, when he says, Paul is righteous, Julie is righteous, Angel is righteous, when he declares you righteous, it's true. It's true. <laughs> he made it true. And all of this happens. How important is this? Well, it split the church. Obviously, the church kind of fell away from this message. Paul understood it. Jesus understood it. They both preached it. And it got preached for centuries. And then gradually the church drifted from this message. And then a guy came along and he's reading the book of Romans. And he's like, why are we all trying to earn our way to heaven? And he, so he starts preaching and he, he nails his complaints about how people were living. He nails it to the door of Wittenberg. We celebrated this October 31st, right? Or were you celebrating something else? I was celebrating, you know, the Reformation Day. Martin Luther, notice, notice his quote here. I love this. He said, I have preached justification by faith so often I feel sometimes that you are slow to receive it that I can almost take the Bible and bang it about your heads. This is what preachers feel all the time. First to themselves and then to everybody else. We're declared righteous. Now, unfortunately, Christianity has been hijacked of late by preachers that want you to live your best life now. And they want you to have a happy life and they want you to smile and feel good about everything. You know, I, you know, there, this this prosperity gospel, this feel good gospel, this self actualization gospel. It sounds attractive because wouldn't we want people to have their best life and to really navigate life well? Well, I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't wish the opposite on somebody. But to confuse that with the gospel is to miss what the gospel is really about. Here's the gospel. Here's the truth. Here's what the Bible is there for. You and I have a wretched sin problem that is unsolvable. And Jesus Christ offered himself as the only sacrifice that could solve your sin problem. And that by faith, he would have your sin and you would have his righteousness. You would be justified. That's the gospel. It's not about you feeling good about yourself. It's about you realizing how desperately you need him. One of the first songs I learned to sing in that church, the picture hanging on my wall, said, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, the whole day long. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. That's justification. The second benefit 
that we are slow to realize is that we are freed from sin. We are freed from sin. And don't get ahead of me on this. Because that doesn't mean all that you think it means or want it to mean. We'll see what it does mean. Romans 6, verses 11 through 14. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. There's a lot here. In fact, there's the entire process that we need to follow as Christians. It's contained in these few verses. So we want to take a look at it. And Paul was making an argument leading up to this, that being joined in the death and the resurrection of Christ is what actually accomplishes the transference from this old life where we are slaves to sin to this new life where we are slaves to righteousness. His argument is you're going to be a slave to something. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. So then dying to sin is not something we hope for. It's actually our reality. And you say, wait a minute, I've not lived that reality. Believe me, I know. I haven't either. But we're talking about things that happen and we're unaware. But then when we, we become aware, aware, we start to realize that we can actually live differently. Have you, have you seen this thing about elephants? It's fascinating. I, I don't know that it's true because I've never seen it in, in, my, in person. I would like to see it in person. That they put a, a rope, when an elephant is young, and they're training it in captivity, a little tiny rope will hold the elephant captive. And the elephant decides pretty early on that rope is enough because he's a little elephant and he can't get away. And they never change the rope. And even though the elephant grows big enough, can easily destroy the rope, he doesn't because he's been conditioned to think that he's a slave to that rope and he can't get away. I don't know if that's real or not, but I've heard that. And it kind of works, doesn't it? We, we, we do that to our pets all the time. I don't agree with these, but I've seen people put shock collars on their dogs. I say, put it on you. Let's see how you like it, right? But you only have to shock a dog two or three times, and then you can turn the collar off, right? Because he knows you can't go past that spot, or you're going to get shocked, and he never even tries. This is how we have lived with sin. Yet, in our salvation, in, in our justification, we've actually been freed from sin, but we're so conditioned to live in it that we don't even realize that so death to sin you understand when we talk about when paul talks about death to sin what does death mean death does not mean ex, uh, separate it, it does not mean extinction it means separation so in other words sin will never leave you in this life you'll always have it in your body you'll always have that desire in your heart those fleeting thoughts in your mind those careless words that come out you'll always struggle with that in your life it's not extinct until you meet Jesus face to face. But you're not bound to it. You're not a slave to it. And that's what Paul is talking about. So what do we need to do then? What is Paul's argument to re for us to realize that we are freed from sin? Because it's already a reality that we're free from it. We're free. We are free. Can you imagine walking up to somebody who is a slave and saying you're free and they're like, I don't believe you. <laughs> you're free. I don't believe you. We are freed from sin, yet we are conditioned to think that we're not. So how do we do it? Well, let's go. Let me wind back this passage here to verse 11. Actually, you've got it on your handout because I want to go. I got some bullet points I'm going to throw your way. We got three bullet points here. Let me read verse 11 again. And I'm going to give you your first bullet. He said, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to use a word there because I like it better. And I think it probably comes from the King James. I just learned it early on. And it's actually a really good word. And it's the word reckon. 
We need a reckoning. Re to reckon something is actually an accounting term. And that's, that's where the NIV kind of says in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. But that doesn't make much sense. But reckon yourselves. You got to do some figuring or some figuring. <laughs> yeah, you got to do some thinking. Count yourselves, reckon yourself dead to sin. Reckoning or considering, considering or let's say calculating is to add up the truths, the facts, and in this case, the facts Paul presented in the first 10 verses. I didn't give you those. You can go back to Romans 6 and read those. But you know these truths. That in Christ, you are not bound to sin. You are set free from sin. So Paul lays out this logical argument. And so the point is, do the math. Do the math. Because if he has given you a new spirit, he, the, the, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and you've got the word of God, you're meditating on your heart. Do you think now that with all God's help, you have to sin? No. Do the math. So he says to reckon. So it's really, we, we need to start realizing that we have power. You say, well, I always give in to this sin, or I, this is what I struggle with, and I'm going to struggle with it the rest of my life. Says who? Is Jesus not enough to help you? Holy Spirit not enough to guide you in all truth and all wisdom? Of course, God is enough. God is enough. The second bullet point is refusing. <laughs> Let me read verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. That's, a, that's an imperative. That's an imperative. Do not. It's a command. God is not in the habit of giving us commands that we cannot obey. There's a command and we can obey it. Do not let sin reign. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. What is reigning? Well, be king. Don't let it be king. Kick him off the throne. Vote it out of office. <laughs> right? It's time, for a, it's time for an election. Yeah, you get sin, you say, you're not in charge of me. You're not the boss of me. You're not going to tell me what to do. So do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Well, easier said than done, right? Well, of course. Why? Because we have this habit of letting sin reign. It takes time to break habits. So how do we go about the ha breaking that habits? The third Jared here for us is presenting. This comes from verse 13. He says, do not offer any part of your sin as an instrument of wickedness. Now that's nigh impossible. I've never seen anyone have success in not doing something that they like to do. Great success comes when we replace something with something better. We got to replace, replace it. I remember my uh, my dad started smoking when he was eight. His cousin taught him that skill, for which he was forever grateful. My dad was in his thirties. I was a little kid. I remember my, both my parents were trying to quit. My mom quit cold turkey. I always thought it was easier for her. I, when she was just here last week, I was asking her about that. She said, no, it was the hardest thing ever in my life. She said, I was sweating, I was angry, and, and it, was just, it was brutal, it was painful. But she, she was stoic about it, because I, I remember she was fine. My dad, on the other hand, he went from, he, he needed something to replace it. And so he kind of went through a, a series of nasty habits and finally settled on one not-so-nasty habit, less, I'll say less nasty habit. But he replaced the cigarettes with chewing tobacco. And if you've ever lived with somebody who's chewing tobacco, be careful any cup you ever pick up. You know, you got to look inside first. You don't take a swig of nothing in that house, let me tell you. Spit cup is the most disgusting thing in the world. <laughs> so he went from chewing tobacco, then he went down to snuff. Like that was better, right? And then from snuff, he went to gum. And then from gum to toothpicks. And to the day he died, he always had a toothpick, didn't he? He always had a toothpick, always. 
He replaced it. We need to find something better than toothpicks. So, so let, me, let me finish this verse. He says, because he says, do not offer any part of your sin as an instrument of wickedness. It's like saying, stop smoking. Okay, that's hard. Right. So replace it. He says, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So the more we get involved in doing something positive with our lives, we can leave the negative behind. You're not going to quit sinning cold turkey, but you're going to start putting in new habits, presenting yourself as an instrument of righteousness rather than an instrument of wickedness. You get the idea. One uh, commentator, uh, this guy goes back a little ways. I'm just going to read you what he wrote. He says, the Christian's breaking with sin is un undoubtedly gradual in its realization. <laughs> I love it when old, mature people say that. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Because I was like, you know, I remember when I first accepted Christ, I thought I was like, I'm going to walk the straight and narrow from now on. Imagine my surprise. Yeah. Okay, the Christian's breaking with sin is undoubtedly gradual in its realization, but absolute and conclusive in its principle. As, in order to break really with an old friend whose evil influence is felt, half measures are insufficient. And the only efficacious means is a frank explanation, followed by a complete rupture which remains like a barrier raised beforehand against every new solicitation. So to break with sin, there is need a decisive and radical act, a divine deed taking possession of the soul and interposing, interposing henceforth between the will and the believer and sin. I like that. That's why some people want to poo-poo dramatic moments, walking an aisle or going to an altar and praying or rededicating yourself by the campfire. I believe in that. I think, you know what, anything, it ha anything that is necessary to say, I'm stopping here, here and no further. It's the proverbial line in the sand. We're not going to go any further. And greatness comes from those kind of moments. Depending on the sin, it could, it could be cleaning out the kitchen. It could, it could be rooting around for the bottles or the cigarettes or whatever. Or the things that cause you so easily to stray. Because the truth is we have been set free from sin. Any dependence on it, any reliance on it, any going back to it is just old habits. It's a tired rope wrapped around your ankle that you could easily snap. Okay, number three. I'll turn the page here. Another benefit simultaneous to placing our faith and trust in Christ, we enter genuine fellowship. Charles Stanley said, God desires to fellowship with us just as much as he fellowshiped with the people of the Old and New Testament. If our relationship with him is a one-way trip and there is no communication or dialogue, then there isn't much fellowship. And that's so true. The one whom Jesus loved wrote this letter, 1 John 1, verse 3 through 10. We proclaim to you what has been what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ we write this to make our joy complete this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you god is light and in him there's no darkness at all if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness we lie and do not live out the truth but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, what does this have to do with fellowship? We imagine that fellowship 
communion among the saints, communion with God is something we just choose to do. The reality is, it is contingent on the presence of sin in our life. Now, we already know, we just talked about the fact that we've been set free from sin. So if we've been set free from sin, yet sin hinders our fellowship with God, prevents it. Prevents it. If I regard sin in my heart, the Lord does not hear me. Why? Because you're treasuring that above him, and that's not a conversation, as Stanley was talking about. Now, this is something that will recur. So it began in the moment when you trusted in Christ. For some people, that's the, that's the closest to God they've ever been, and then they quickly retreat from that. But the moment you trusted in Christ for your salvation, you had fellowship with God, whether you're aware of it or not. Because there's no sin. You're in utter faith in that moment. Now then, in the Christian journey, we are going to sin. We are going to stumble. But John gave us the remedy. The remedy is confession. The word confession literally means to say the same thing. So you call it what it is. You don't say, I was spinning a yarn. You say, I was gossiping. It was gossip is gossip. You know, hatred is hatred. Lying is lying. You call it what it is. Now, John's remedy, if we confess our sins, he is faithful just to forgive us our sins. Some people want, at this point want to get off on the tangent of public versus private confession. We, we really just only need to confess at the level of the sin. You understand what I'm saying? If, if this is a sin between you and, you know, somebody you care about or somebody you don't care about or that neighbor that you hate, the confession needs to be along with them. Include them in that. Listen, I, I was angry at you. I yelled at you yesterday, and I'm sorry. And you're confessing that sin to them and before God. And there's forgiveness. Now, that person may not forgive you. Okay. You can't control that, but God does. It's a promise. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin. Now, if you sin on the national level, you know, you're president of the United States and you lie, you, you need to confess to the nation, I lied. It, you confess on the level of the sin. Now, if you sin privately, do you need to go tell everybody? Please no. Please no. I had a young man come to me one time. He was a newlywed. And he was having improper thoughts. And he felt really guilty about it. I'm like, okay. So I took him to 1 John 1, verse 9. I said, here you go. Talk to God. Confess it. And I want you to fill your mind with some memory verses. Rather than thinking about that, I want you to think about this. Okay. But I think I should tell my wife. I said, no, you shouldn't. Please understand, at this moment, she was about nine months pregnant. She was massive. What's, what's her confidence level at this point, ladies? Okay. Is she a little insecure about her body? Yeah. Does she need to hear her, her toothpick husband come and say that he's thinking about other women? No, she didn't need to hear that. I said, no, 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 you don't. No, this is you, God, me, done. Okay, this, let's leave it there. She says, no, I really think I should. I said, I really think you shouldn't. Did he follow my advice? Probably not. He didn't. Idiot. And his marriage didn't last. She, was a, she went into counseling. She was so humiliated and crushed in this most vulnerable moment of her life. I mean, it, she tanked. I mean, it was the saddest thing you ever saw. You confess on a level of sin, private sin, private confession. God hears you. God forgives. That's enough. The confession is absolutely essential that we grow accustomed if we're going to enjoy the fellowship. Now, this fellowship is familial. You can't lose it. It's there, but you can't hinder it. Okay, let me explain what I mean. When you're brought into God's family, that's permanent. Isn't that good news? That's good news. You are a son or a daughter of God, and you will not lose that. So, any sin that you do, you're not going to lose that salvation, but you are going to hinder that relationship. You know, it's like telling your mother, I don't like your cooking. Okay, we got a problem, right? You need to cook for yourself. But you're not going to disown the child, right? But there's a problem there. Maybe an apology is necessary. Confession. So we do things all the time that hinder our interpersonal relationships. The only way to fix those we, we don't sever them completely. I know people do in real life, but we're not supposed to. We confess and we fix that. The same is true with God. Any sin is an offense to God. You confess it to God and he forgives you. 
And that fellowship, that intimacy that comes in living the life is more valuable than we realize. We, we think of this as just, oh, is that really a benefit? Do I need fellowship with God? Well, how are you doing navigating your life on your own? You know, you know, you know, I think we need more than we realize. And that fellowship is an active conversation of prayer and Bible reading and meditation, not the worldly kind of meditation, but uh, focused thinking on God's word and God's plan and God's will. That's a benefit that comes with salvation. Last one. We are. Oh, yeah, I got, I got my quote in there. Yep. Last one. We are adopted into God's family. Now, adoption is an interesting thing, uh, biblically speaking. Uh, when we talk about being born again, being born again has this imagery of being a child. And, and certainly, spiritually, that's, that is the metaphoric reality. When you first become a Christian, you're a baby in the faith you know nothing. And you gradually grow as you're exposed to the nourishment of the Word of God, the milk and then ultimately the meat, and you grow into adulthood. So being born again, that metaphor is very vivid in the sense that it tells us that, you know, you don't really know anything. That's why you don't put a baby Christian up to preach because they're just a baby. They got to be nurtured. They got to grow. Adoption is completely different. Adoption has this idea of, of an adult uh, coming into God's family with, with rights and responsibilities and, and a uh, you know, in an activity level that you don't see or development level that you don't see in a baby. So the idea of adoption is more about the relationship with the one that is doing the adopting and the, and the significance of that. Now, interestingly, most cultures in the world have some form of, uh, of adoption. In fact, we see it uh, a couple times in the Bible. Moses Right? Moses was born a slave. His mother was a slave. He was born a slave. And then there was a, you know, there was this murder order. So she puts him in the basket, floats him down the river. And where does he end up? <laughs> he ends up in Pharaoh's household, adopted out of the river, taken out of the reeds. Uh, the New Zoo tablets talk about the custom of uh, if, a child, if a couple is childless, they could adopt a son who would serve them in their life and would be their heir in death. Interestingly, though, the Hebrew law in the Old Testament uh, does not have anything to say about adoption. Adoption is absent, interestingly, absent from the Hebrew law, from the Old Testament law. Now, there is a provision, though, for childlessness. It's called the Leverite marriage. We won't get into that. But, so there's not adoption, but you could have a, a child if, if someone had died. There was a remedy for that. The, uh, the Greek word for adoption does not occur in the New Testament. It does not occur in the Greek version of the Old Testament. Uh, but Paul uses it here because it uh, was very common in the Greco-Roman world. And the New Testament is written in that background. So rather than drawing from the Hebrew scriptures, he looks at his culture and he describes our relationship with God now in this identifiable cultural reality called adoption. So a childless couple, couple could adopt a son who would then become their heir. Now, in that culture, in the Greek culture, if the adopted son had living biological parents, uh, they lose their claim over the child, Right? Because the one adopting them presumably offered a better life. Now, <laughs> you and I were born uh, children of this world. And so when we place our faith and trust in Christ, Scripture says that we're adopted into God's family. That's for a better life. That means that the world loses its claim over us. Isn't that good news? few verses, Romans 8, 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. So when we pray to God as our heavenly father, we're not just imitating Jesus. 
we're entering into this reality that we are children, the sons, the daughters of God by the spirit of adoption, which means that we are joint heirs, Paul says, with Christ. That all the benefits that God gives to his children give uh, comes to us. Ephesians 1, 5, just uh, jumping in the middle of a thought there, he says he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Galatians 4, 5, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. The whole, point, the whole point of this language that Paul is using is that then we have legal claim. We are not, and I'm using this word in the technical sense, bastards. We're not ir- illegitimate children. We are legitimately the sons and the daughters of God with all the rights, honors, and privileges appertaining thereto. So what is what are the ramifications of adoption? I'll give you uh, just a couple. Four here at the end of, uh, of your outline there. The first one is a new family. Adoption means placing us into a family which we did not naturally belong. The children of wrath become the children of God. Oh, that's good news. Secondly, it means freedom from the past. When Paul in Galatians 4, he was thinking he was thinking primarily about the law, that the Jew becoming a Christian is set free from the confines, from the restrictions of the law. So his adoption meant real freedom, freedom. But even in our day and age, there's so many people that because of a horrible childhood or trauma, you know, they want to spend their lives dwelling on this like they're prisoners and they're, these are their, you know, family of uh, origin issues that have kept them in bondage. Listen, in Christ, new family, new family, freedom. Third, means you're chosen. Adoption, biblical adoption is only possible because the adoptor chose you. And me. When did he do that? Well, we just read it in Ephesians 1 5. You got it right up there. Before the creation of the world. Now, that, that goes beyond our ability to think, but so before he ever says, Let there be light, God knew you and he chose you. Now, we're going to deep dive into that next week. We're going to talk about election and predestination. Bring your seatbelt. Okay. But let's just say this. This is an indisputable truth in Ephesians 1, 1 5. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Wow. We'll explore that more next week. And finally, privileged. Adoption means we have all the rights, all the privileges of being in God's family. We got to grow into those to realize them, but they're ours. There's no second-class citizens in heaven. When you make your way there, don't worry. Don't worry about what it's going to be like. That you're going to kind of have to sneak in the back door, the side door. You know, kind of keep it lay low until people start accepting. Well, I guess you got here. Didn't deserve it. Yeah, none of us do. But you'll walk in. You'll walk in the front gate. It's a great fanfare. I'll say, you're here! Thank God you're here. Because no one gets there on their own. No one has enough. No one can ever merit heaven. But we've been adopted. We were chosen. We had all the privileges. Isn't that good news? That's good news. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, we could spend all night just going over all the things that you've given us in in him. Suffice it to say right now, Lord, thank you. We love you. We could ask for nothing more than what you've already given more than we could ever desire, more than we could ever deserve. So thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.